Uh, model, somebody want to give me an idea? Model, when you have a model as a researcher, what do you have? What's going on? I know it's early, but. Representation of reality. Okay, some representation. So this student is really doing something. They're really thinking something. Um, one of my mentors, Les Stuffy, would say, you'll never know what they're really thinking. So, okay, but you shouldn't give up, right? You build your model and you check it. So design-based research is a process of going through. So that, that actually, that um, student has some models about what the teacher means, right? The researcher has models about how they're thinking. And it kind of even goes back and forth a little bit. There's these, can you believe it? There's misunderstandings between people. <laughs> All right, so, so we're working on building better understandings of how kids are thinking. Um, I just wanted to um, acknowledge the colleagues that I work with. Um, how do you raise a child in a village, right? So I'm as part of my village. I'm still growing, I hope. Purpose, uh, to build accounts of children's developing knowledge um, in a domain, for example, geography or mathematics or Spanish or something that support learning standards in that domain. Not necessarily the standards we have now, but experts pick standards and then try to work towards them. We've talked about that here. Means, use research methods to establish and improve learning trajectories or learning progressions that undergird curriculum standards and improve curriculum. Um, there's an article that I was citing there, Curriculum Research Framework, that's very helpful if you want to think about, um, if you're ever talking to a, a, per se, a publisher or somebody, that they're saying, well, this is a research-based Curriculum. You can ask them a few very informed questions and check and see what the process <coughs> is. But more, more to the point, you can be doing the process that you know is a research-based design process for curriculum development. So I, I wanted to start like easy. I guess I wasn't thinking Saturday morning, but I probably should have been. So we have ideas about how children develop. We want to check the ideas. Are they good ideas? That means are they attractive? Tra do they have traction? How's that? Um, so we have experiments that we do to check. We reflect on our experiences of educational situations. Um, we set up our own observations. We reach generalizations. I don't think, if I start saying something you disagree with, you're welcome to raise your hand and say, no, we don't. So we build cognitive models about the way children learn, representations. Then we interpret that. Or, well, first we have the model, then we observe, then we interpret. We're going to talk about that more extensively during the morning. Based on our interpretation, we modify our cognitive models, prepare to observe and check again, starting to look like a cyclical process. Um, I think that there are, it helps to have a background of how you think people grow and develop. So um, this is my go-to theoretical account, um, hierarchic interactionalism. Uh, Doug Clements and Julie Sarama developed, developed this in 2007. The 12 tenets, the later parts, as you read through it, it talks about nature and nurture and, and environmental influences and background and talks pretty much about everything. And it puts things in tension. You know, sometimes people say, well, I really think this. And it kind of gets like, yeah, but you can't only say that. So I think you've got to check yourself if you have enough tension going on in your system. And this one does. Um, there's another assumption here that there are separable states of knowledge. We've been talking about levels. That's one of the hardest things to argue for, but it's worthwhile. It's gonna, it can be very helpful if it's true, and you want to affect transitions from one state to another. Um, do you ever think, well, what am I gonna tell somebody on a plane if they say, what are you interested in? Why do you do research? So, uh, um, my wife says, have a short answer, so I try to do that. Um, so, um, so, the short answer is I like number and space, but another answer is I like to find mechanisms for learning. Do you like that? You like to find actually how they learn. I think it's just like wonderful. So, but also really hard. So I find that it takes this kind of cyclical work. Um, I wanted to start right, way, right away with saying, here's something that's a product that we've come up with um, in our work. This is one of the ways we try to show what happened when we watched, we walked along through four years of time with eight kids at one site and eight kids at another. We lost some kids at both sites, but over time, uh, for some of them, we got these pictures. Um, we got a lot of things, but here's one of them, okay? So what this says is um, the dark gray band um, is the dominant level and the level names over there. 
can be described. I'm sorry, they're acronymical. Um, but I tried to write out some of them partially. This is about understanding area. We also look at linear and volume things. But in terms of area, partial coverer, area unit related repeater, um, partial rows structurer, area row and column structure, eventually array structurer. So we're looking at that kind of thinking over this time frame. And we also see fallbacks and reaching ups. And we note those with those lines that are there. Could you even just talk a little bit about what you're saying there? Yeah. Like, because yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, exactly, asking you more of a specific question. Yeah. Just, just this sense of, I, I, you're talking about math knowledge. Talking about their knowledge of space, right. being able to measure, in this case, area, regions. Mm -hmm. Yeah. OK. And what's an array structure? Oh. So the reason I think that's the most sophisticated level, AS is up at the top, one up there, is that it, it has this notion of the child over there next to Dick that has that thinking bubble. That child is able to impose arrays on things. Oh, I see that's, that wall is kind of a messed up array. Oh, well, I guess it's there. The, the, this one. It's a rectangular unit array, though, right? Uh, and now they're going to see that, interpret that. There, yeah, thank you. Mm -hmm. Let me see. Please look up. <laughs> so there's a nice array up there. Um, and not all children look and see what you see, right? Again, right? The misunderstanding of our... So we, we found that we think they understand arrays because they start looking at a row and start repeating the row. And we found that that's still not an array. So these partial understandings that we've been talking about? Anybody else want to ask a question? I'm glad you asked. Yes? What, what's the data collected? How do you collect the data? How do I collect the data? Um, through tutoring sessions over and over again, about nine or ten a year. We draw them out of the classroom. In this case, there was, there was a research school. Is that the right word? A lab school. And so we actually had a little glassed-in room next to the classroom. We could take a couple of us would be in there. We might take one or two kids at a time, sit down for 20, 25 minutes. And what do you do? Um, good. Okay, that's fair. It's all fair. <laughs> <laughs> so um, I sit down and I say, Hui, here, I'd like you to um, uh, compare this to the size of this, the table, the paper size to the, how much larger is the table than this? And, and then I step back and I see what she starts to do. If she's stuck, and we're going to talk about this, right, in different ways, but we're going to talk about this later today. So. I'm going to let that be a, that's a good question. Any follow-up to that? Or? All right, so I'm going to go on. Um, who's timing me? My, is my, is my, you're going to tell me? How much you're, time do you're I have? Okay. Oh. You're okay. You're fine. Okay. Will you give me a five-minute symbol yep. or something? Yeah, the horn's going to go off. <laughs> <laughs> I'll step on my foot. Yeah. So, so you see how you're collecting the data. Yeah. Then how do you analyze it? Is it videotaped? Is it transcript? It's it videotaped. We only transcribe what we have to because we would die if we transcribed everything. <laughs> because it's not all the same level of need for it. Um, so I have a, a couple of grad students who tended to have about four students they were responsible for. Um, and um, so there were about four of us working with about eight kids. We would kind of show that load up. Um, so that's really good. So. A uh, quick answer is, before I go talk to Hui, if she's one of these students, I have to predict. If I don't predict, this is a lost enterprise. Um, even the first time I should predict be before I meet her. But uh, as I've built, built this interaction of tutoring over time, every time I need to have a documented set of, I think I'm modeling, sorry, back on the other one, but I'm modeling, okay, I think she's partial row structure because last time this, I write all this out. Um, I'm going to give her this, and then I'm going to give her that, which I think will be too easy. I'm going to give her this, which I think will be too hard, and then I check. And I also am interacting um, in a way that's creative a little bit. I don't just say, too bad, she can't do that, go on. <coughs> so I'll support, I try to help, and then I have a note about it. I had to help this way. That's what you're asking. So it's really ethnography. Yeah. That's fair. I say I try to write novels about these kids, mm -hmm. but I back away from that one then. Publisher doesn't want a whole novel on each kid, right? So, and, and how do you select these eight? I mean, um, I only argue. I'm, I'm going to guess that you mean is this representative sample? Is that what you mean? Yes. Because yeah. I mean, you can't really so, 
right? No, you can't say that it's a representative sample of anything except kids in the U.S. in a Midwestern suburban place with, with a typical mix of kids from that town. Are they all normal? <laughs> okay, I, I accept that, except I moved to Bloomington to get rid of that oh, okay. question. So, yes, Bloomington Normal is where I'm from. So, um, so do they represent everybody? No. We say when, we're, when we've gotten to this point, we say here's a plausible trajectory. Okay, I don't know if you object to that, you hate that, or, or what, but we argue that, um, remember I said yesterday something like innate, innate abilities are fairly strong and strident in how people, in other words, I think a lot of kids learn things pretty similar ways. Um, recently, I was just at, um, uh, what was that conference? I was talking about recent conference. Um, uh, no, the MSP, just recent last week. Been here too many times. But so, uh, so I spoke to Professor Barry from Virginia. He spoke, and he worked with um, black boys. I think he had 18 or 19 of them. He watched them from grade five to like 19 years old of age. He, that's a long story he gives. I thought, oh, I gotta talk to him. So I went up and talked to him afterwards and I said, I do this, I study how kids learn and, and you study how kids are influenced and the kind of things that are going on supporting them. And I said, what do you think if you watched um, those same kids, do you think they would grow really differently than the kids I watch? Now I know this is just him thinking and me talking, but he's like, no, I don't expect them to really grow differently. I think it'll probably be the same kind of trajectory you've got. I didn't tell him what to say. That's what he said. He said, I think what's different is the influences, the cultural influences around what motivates them, what guides them, what keeps them going. That's really different than the kids that you worked with probably. He didn't even know who they were. But he said, I don't really expect him to see fundamental learning things differently. I don't know how great that is, so it's research that needs to be done. Um, I can't do all of it, so I do. This is really expensive kind of research to do longitudinal work over four years, and we are appreciative of the National Science Foundation helping us to do that. Right, we, we, we needed, oh, I lost this slide. So, Jeff, I got a question about stress associated with your you think I'm looking stressed? No. <laughs> <laughs> okay, John, go ahead. You might convey that to the students. As a researcher. No. So stress definitely has an influence on how people respond. Oh, they're in a stress situation. Yeah. So is that just the noise that we've got to deal with as we collect this data, or is there a way to minimize that, that effect on the brain in terms of how people respond? Um, I agree they're in a different situation than if they're in a classroom or in a small group, uh, but they can be in situations where their teacher might stop and talk to them. It's not totally unusual for school, I don't think, but it is. And, and you, if you watched one, which you can later, you'll see some. Uh, they got to know us, we got to know them, we joked with them, I mean, we tried to do everything we could to this is low key. They didn't have our goal structure, remember. So we had this goal structure, like I gotta learn this, they could care less if we learned that, right? <laughs> so they're kind of, we just made it as much as we could, playful, we're measuring stuff, we're talking about it. Um, and, you, and you named it a tutoring session. I do that to explain it to you. What do I call it myself? A teaching experiment. What do you call it to the children? Oh yeah, we're just kind of, we're just doing some tasks to, um, we're doing some research. We have to say oh, we're doing research. Right. Uh, so I've heard you guys talk about IRBs. One of the things, you can get into schools, um, it takes building a relationship, but one of the things that makes it fairly easy, right now we're working in middle schools, kind of just here and there, and we just say, look, can we, when you do small group time, can we talk to one of the small groups and just guide them? The teacher's like, yeah, that'll be great. <laughs> In fact, can you share what you talk about so I can do that next time? So, you know, it's not totally, I don't know if that's where you were going with that, but. Oh. Well, I was just thinking of students and thinking that, you know, kids go off to tutoring. Yeah, what do they think they're doing? Right, what yeah. do they think they're Well, in doing? fact, the other kids are like, can I go? Hey, I wanna go. <laughs> so. Uh, building a theory is a learning trajectory or progression requires a program of research. I want to say that it's not one study. Um, so um, I clicked into Rich Lair. That's always a good thing. Listen to Rich Lair. Um, this is a wise guy. He's not like that. He's a wise fellow. How's that? He's learned a lot. He thinks well, thinks on his feet, and he does some really nice work. So I commend his work to you. Um, in fact, he's one of the people that He's worked with kids in first, second, third grade. 
it's almost kind of hard to say. Two standard deviation growth, can you do that with a classroom of kids? Like, that's pretty amazing. But there you go. So there's a reason to go look at his work. Um, so, but he talks about if you're going to really understand um, this kind of thing, this kind of growth, you're going to need to commit to a few studies in a row, probably. Okay. So I'm trying to say they overlap, they, they build um, the program. Um, a different way of saying it is that there's several things going on. There's a researcher's model, a teacher's model, a student's model, and you can pick and choose what you want to emphasize to talk about. This doesn't say, in fact, I can't do it, neither can Dick Lesh, who came up with this. Um, is that fair? Yeah, I think it's fair. Dick hasn't yet found somebody that can do it. So maybe he can do it, but nobody else can emulate it so far, where you actually keep all three perspectives alive and well in one, one study. It's difficult. But um, the multi-tiered teaching experiment is brilliant in the sense of a high aspiration. How's that? Um, because it is all happening, and it, it's kind of nice to be able to try to comment on it and think about it. But I tend to focus <coughs> on one and be aware that next time I can go back through that and think about the other model and another model yet. Yeah. The hardest one, but the most beneficial one in design work is the researcher's model building. If you don't keep a record of your own growth, then you're not really a design researcher. I think that's fair. I don't know what you think. It's tough, but um, a learning trajectory proposes a model. Um, we want to state successively more sophisticated levels. We want to tie each level to a model of mental actions on objects. And we want to tie the levels and the corresponding mental actions on objects to hypothesize instructional intervention. So if you think back on it, there's three columns in the one that I presented in my set of things that you saw. The first column is successively more sophisticated levels in a kind of observational language. What could you see the kid doing? Then what, what are they probably thinking that's in the central column? And in the far column, what kind of things could you do to help them grow? Okay, so actually I, I think right now, talk to your neighbor and tell them Design, research, do they fit together, do they not? What are they? Actually, let's start with design. Talk to your neighbor. What is design? What do you think of when you say design? I'm curious, I don't want to leave it too long, I don't want to put it up, but somebody tell me design. Let's get a couple of design comments. Design is <laughs> having a framework. Okay, keep going. I'm sure you didn't all say that. Did you all say that? To create? Are you reading something? No. Why did you all say framework? I don't know. But what else? What else? I hear. Organized plan. Organized plan, design. Organized plan, framework, keep talking. Create. Create, thank you. I was looking for the artist, the designer, right? <laughs> yes? Okay, so research, how is that different than design work? If you're not ahead of me a little bit, it won't be as helpful when we go on. But research, you hypothesize a goal. You're looking You've got a very certain goal and you want certainty out of it, right? Mm -hmm. You're trying to get certainty. The designer is trying to get something that's workable beautiful, something after, they, they have a goal, but the researcher has a goal that's, I think their goal is a little different. They want a question. They have a question and they want to answer a question. And would they ask the question like, um, just about how Sean learns and they would be satisfied, I'm gonna write a book about how Sean, no, they're gonna to wanna to know, is there something about how she learns that can be generalized, right? So usually the question is some kind of generalized question, yes? Okay, a tough one in the audience, okay. Um, <laughs> I'll just let that be. I'm thinking about it though. Some research is inductive. Some research is inductive, not necessarily deductive. Is that where you're going? Yeah, not okay. hypothesis driven, but just no. trying to mm -hmm. understand mm -hmm. the observations. Mm -hmm. Okay, okay, that's helpful to think about. Okay, so let's go on. Um, I've tried to answer the two questions, so let's think this about this for a second this way. I say it's a sequence of decisions uh, to, actually I don't say this, <coughs> Edelson said this, I thought this was helpful. So a sequence of decisions made to balance goals and constraints, there are decisions about how the design process will proceed, what needs and opportunities the design will address, what form the resulting design will take, kind of product, 
And then I make client comments here. Design is an active response to a challenge. A problem leads to some product, tool, object. <coughs> Cycles, probably. Designers <coughs> tend to not like the, the, you know, the image of throwing the paper out on the floor, <coughs> right? That's a designing idea. Um, imagining, building, checking, changing, revising, delete, eventually to a product. Comprehensive kind of scope. Does it generalize? Can it produce theoretical outcomes? But that set as a question. Research, investigating a question. Um, I'll say that so. Describe maybe, or look for general pattern, well, maybe not. <laughs> Research, I actually still think general. Research may explore, but we should talk. Just confirm or just or confirm. Um, so it should be, that's confirmability is a big deal. It's, it's so cool to ask a research question that nobody can know whether you answered it or not, because hey, you're not really accountable, but <laughs> it's probably not a good research question yet. Um, articulating a claim, measurable terms, setting up a test. Does this generalize? Maybe not. Can it produce theoretical outcomes? I hope so. Um, so, these two things can fit together. I say probably it needs to be exploratory work, constructive, it's going to have to be, I, I should have said extensive, sorry, wrong word choice there. I'm left-handed. More than a few weeks, uh, perhaps as long as a semester, I actually suggest that sometimes it's good to plan it out. It might take two years to do this. If you're really trying to do design-based research, it takes a while. Would you guys say that's fair? We've done this. Okay. Um, so John Clement, uh, there's a nice design handbook um, that uh, Kelly and Lush did in 2000. It's been updated in 2008. The 2000 version had John Clement's work, um, a science educator, right? Am I right? I think so. So um, that's a good tension, exploratory or confirmatory research. Um, I actually think you can get a bit of confirmatory with design-based research. I, I don't think we want to give it up and say, no, it's only exploratory, but it's most naturally that, I think, and then you have to work at getting it to be confirmatory. Um, just a question for a minute. Okay, so we're talking about design-based research. Is all, is all research design-based? Somebody tell me a couple of other examples. I chose one, randomized control studies. Is there anything else that's not design-based research? Because otherwise we start thinking that we're just talking about all good research. And I didn't mean, to, I'm not saying all good research is design-based research, so. Tell your neighbor something. You guys are quiet, talk to your neighbor. You wanna talk? Okay. 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 So I want to. Elizabeth commented. So. She said pure ethnography, like Margaret Mead's work, isn't design-based research. Some others. What are some other things that you? Some type of teacher action research. Teacher action research. Something else. Attitudinal survey research. Attitudinal survey research. Okay, so I just wanted to clarify. It's not all like that, all right? Um, thank you. So, here, um, this is my claim, okay? I didn't cite anybody. I think you need to focus on what's going on in a child's thinking and try to get, um, I think, describing schemes, or you can use different uh, theoretical ideas, about it, but I think somehow you need to be characterizing their internal structuring that they're doing, how they're growing. Um, so I talk about schemes. Um, we, you might hear other people using other words, right? So you can ask and get that. I say a scheme is an anticipatory frame. It marks the type of experience that someone has met associated with specific actions that are productive or effective. And that sounded pretty academic. So um, if I talk to you, I don't know if you ever done this experiment to explain schemes or heard somebody do it. Um, it, it can't work now because you've already seen what I'm going to do. Do you know what, Amelia? The kind of you cue. You tell them a story. They have no idea what you're talking about. You go, McDonald's. They go, oh, I see what you're talking about. If they didn't have the scheme, it didn't work. But if they do, it works easily. Um, how might we describe? So schemes are things that help you interpret, right? Several relevant schemes that should be addressed. This is free advice for me, so you can just ignore it if you want. Um, I love to think about what are the components in thinking that are kind of broad, and this might work for you because I didn't write measurement specific stuff, right? You can see that's very cognitive, but I think if you pay attention to those elements, you make good progress. People categorize, they discriminate. You know, I know it has baggage, so what's another word? Um, distinguish, okay? Say, what's another word? I don't know. 
You know what I mean? They tell the difference between things. And that's because they have categories. You think in categories. Uh, mathematics, one characterization of mathematics is the whole thing is just category theory. Okay, so it has some, some validity. Um, matching, ordering, sequencing, those are kind of things. Coordinating, pulling things back together, correspondences, and look for coherence, analysis into components, synthesis, how it fits in a hierarchy or system. The list could be in included many more, but I, those are ones that hit me in the face. So I would think that you might do well by paying attention to those. Well, actually, I'm going to stop and ask. Does anything up there resonate with geography education? If it does, raise your hand and give me an, uh, kind of a short example. Think for a second if you want. But okay, no? categorize. I okay. The first one, regionalization. Yep. Mm -hmm. Regionalization. Yeah. Okay. Others. Thinking in your field with these kind of terms, can you give me some? I wonder if discriminating could be some sort of change over time, like our mm -hmm. example yesterday. The way it is now, water, water the way it is later. Then, watershed now. Noticing differences. Okay. Yeah. Kind of ordering, sequencing, thinking of scale issues. Okay. Okay, so it worked. So you got, you're with me. All right. So um, we begin. How do you build a learning trajectory or a learning progression? You work from the existing research literature. We chatted a little bit at the end of the day yesterday. That's so critical. It's got some work, but it's, and it's, what's a cool thing is that you've already started that, the two of you. Thank you for contributing that work. Set hypotheses about children's developing knowledge. Um, specify the components of what you think. Th I think you guys call this unpacking. Let's say <laughs> unpacking, point two, okay? Conceptual knowledge, practices, situational contextual knowledge. Those are some of the things you unpack. Uh, clinical interviews. I overweighted this. Two clinical interview points and one about assessment. So can you tell which one I'm going to work on? But they're going to work on the other one. So they'll make their point larger. Um, clinical interviews provide specific design stations for trying out tasks with separable levels or states of knowledge. Clinical interviews provide a platform to design longitudinal studies to see if what you're thinking happens over time actually does happen over time for particular kids. It's hard to do that with some instruments, but it's easier with other approaches, I should say. Um, so this tutoring model that I talked to you about is a one that works well. It's hard to do item response theory and follow particular kids. I think I've been told that by people out of the Bear Group. Um, it's not the wisest thing to make claims about, I know this particular child did this. It's harder to do that anyway. Um, thank you for telling me I'm not completely up to Yep, yep, yep. And did you ask? Okay, thank you. Um, how do you feel like, do you feel like there's, I mean, they're sort of following one kid over several years and then there's written assessments, mm -hmm. which are more These are extremes, right? Doing Pardon? this and doing that, these right, are extremely they're, different. They're sort of, I don't know, how do you feel about maybe the in-between where you do written assessments over, you know, like a pre-post or over some I do that. experience? I mean, so yeah. So I you do have kind of the in. intermediate, sort of larger sample, and it's a smaller, mm -hmm. smaller time. So we also looked at 200 kids at the beginning from the school where we worked, mm -hmm. and at the end, our first assessment was crummy, so we don't pay a lot of attention to it. But so it wasn't my best one. It wasn't my best work. So it's not like written assessments are only a one time. No, they're not. And we tend to try to use those with classes, too, in the short term. And the other thing that happens is people often, um, we looked at one of the researchers' work yesterday, on Schwartz, I think. Schwartz, I was, talk I was hearing Schwartz talk at uh, the DRK-12 conference, and <coughs> her name Christine, is that right? Christine. Christine was talking and saying uh, about how she'd done the kind of item response theory large, but I, and I said, um, to her and a couple of other people, have you done um, kind of drill down interviews? Yes, she said, I have. I really like that. It, it adds the breadth and the depth that I'm interested in and it helps me get at mechanisms. So these things can be put to work together. Beth, is that what you wanted to emphasize? Yeah. I'm, I don't mean to, yeah, no, okay. Yeah. All right, so written assessments provide a platform for cross-sectional sampling of children, a wide range of development over longer periods of time maybe, large period maybe. Um, so, the last couple minutes, let's do 
what can you do with teaching experiments, these tutoring things? You can document decisions in the sequence of the sessions. Um, I said you have to write about your own model about how the child is going to grow and then check it. Um, cycling from one session to the next. You have to be rigorous about your own expectations for how you do that. Um, and there's concurrent analysis and also later looking back on the whole thing. That's the um, retrospective. So um, you have to go back through this too. I want to I want to spend the last two minutes this way. <coughs> Can you read anything on that, or is it? <laughs> it's a poster, a poster session, um, DRK twelve, right? So, <laughs> can you read it though, or no? No. no. All right. No. So, um, so I'm going to do a point because you'll have this. You could blow it up on your computer and look if you want. I'm going to chat through a couple pieces here. So we we tried recently to talk back, looking back across the four years, what are some things we did to try to improve? Um, so that's not the first question, how do you build a learning trajectory progression, I guess, is the first question, but also how do you improve it? So one of the things we do is we take a look with these kind of tables and things, and on this one here, we looked at that and we said, you know, about looking at seven kids, jamming them all onto the same chart, it looks like there's a long period of time that they're stuck at PRS, partial row structure. That doesn't seem like it ought to be. Why? We, we wanted to ask why, so we ended up trying to separate that out into levels A and B. Here's another picture that'll kind of work here. This used to go one, two, three, four, five, six in a row, just a sequence. And then um, it got pulled into this funny arrangement where Indirect link compare goes off and sits on its own because we can't tell, but it seems to be almost out here associated but not critical to the sequence. Um, we, we think we move right into end to end and skip past indirect. And that's one of those things where we were taking a Piagetian assumption, but we think it didn't quite play out there. Um, last one that's interesting, I think, to point to <laughs> here at this level is um, on the left, Mike Batista's work, on the right, Clement Sarama and Barrett's work. We both did length learning trajectory work, and we came up with different names. So instead of giving up, somebody challenged us, um, Phil Darrow, Fritz Mosier, the CPRI folks, why don't you guys compare some of those trajectory things and see if they fit together? Well, that's a good idea. Um, and I, I would encourage that kind of work, a little more of that kind of work. Um, it's not the same, and I think recently the call from NSF to design, I forgot what it's called, the design guidance report. Common, common guidelines. Thank you. Common guidelines. One of the things that I think is really cool there is that it says, have one research group pick up another research group design or their theory and check it out independently. And I don't know, I don't know if they trade, that's probably not gonna work. Somehow you're gonna have to do that. But if you can work that out, that's a, a good way to start checking things. And we found it's not a perfect match. So we told you how bad it was, how good it was. The arrows try to show the matching, and it was a really good process to go through. That's published in um, uh, Learning to Think. Learning Over Time, a book that just came out. Thank you. How about one, one question before we break up into our method session? Yes, okay. and, and it's more of an observation. Okay. You might have missed this in August, but there was a piece that was um, talked about the failure to replicate. Yeah. And the rarity of replication, especially in education research, I'll post it on the on the name. But I, I think this particular group of people has a real opportunity to change that. So anyway, just well, I, I wanted us to think about thank that. Thank you very much.